Now, one night I had a dream, a nightmare really, and all I remember from this dream was that my mind was conscious. I sensed this discomfort because I, I, I just wasn't familiar with these surroundings. And I was suspended in darkness. In any direction that I looked, I saw nothing. Nothing but deep, deep darkness in all directions as far as I could see. And then I realized something. I realized that I had no movement. I had no hands to move, no arms to move, no legs to move. In this nightmare, I was just a mind disconnected from any physical body, suspended in the darkness, that discomfort I felt began to intensify until it became pain, but the pain was peculiar because I couldn't even tell you where it was coming from. It was just the state of agony. And no matter how much I struggled to find movement, no matter how much I searched for footing, as often as I looked for reference, there was none, nothing but confusion, nothing but questions. Did I die? Am I in a coma? How long will this last? Is there anyone else here? Those thoughts echoed in the blackness with no one to respond. Now, I must have had that experience for no more than two, three minutes, but it seemed like much longer. Now, I don't know how much of what is described about hell is literal. I don't know how much exactly is figurative. But if hell is anything like that dream I had, you don't want to go there. Brother David, are you trying to scare people into getting saved? No. I simply share the truth and we don't respond to the gospel because of our fear of hell. We respond to the gospel because we recognize our need for a savior. Now, in Luke chapter 16, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen, and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Verse 22 of Luke 16. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here. And no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, 
They won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Now, the Bible very clearly lays out a picture of hell for us here. How much is figurative, how much is literal is really not the point because there are certain things we can learn about hell that are certain, as I'll go over in a moment. But you know, there's this really wicked doctrine that's floating around the world and making its way into certain parts of the church. It's a doctrine of devils. Let me just be very clear about this. It's a doctrine of devils called universalism. And what's happening is in an attempt to make the gospel more palatable, in an attempt to make the gospel more friendly or nice sounding, people are beginning to twist the scripture, especially by looking to the original language, in an attempt to erase the idea of hell. Simply put, whether they will admit it or not, what's actually taught in that doctrine is that ultimately everyone goes to heaven no matter what they did with Jesus. And some look at this parable and they say, well, it was just a parable. Surely it wasn't grounded in reality. Surely it wasn't an actual account. Now, it's quite possible that this story of the rich man in hell was a parable, not an actual account. But consider this. Have you noticed that Jesus' parables were always grounded in reality? He used real-life constructs to tell a story. For example, agriculture. If the story of the rich man is a parable then all this means is that Jesus is using the reality of the afterlife to help make a point. Parable or not, the torments described here must be real. Jesus would not use a lie to communicate a truth. And consider also that in verse 29, the scripture says, but Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. In other words, this was understood even in the ancient world. The Old Testament contains enough truth about this reality that someone is properly warned of the terrors of hell simply by reading the Old Testament. So what can we glean from this portion of Scripture about this place of torment? Well, as you look through the Scripture, you will not see this idea of a torture chamber and demons running around in charge of the place. They too are punished in this place. It's possible that the Bible is not even describing literal flames. But what we do know is that this is a horrific place of separation from God that people who do not receive Christ go to when they pass into eternity. In verse 23, we see that it's a place of consciousness. There in torment, he saw Abraham. This man was aware of his surroundings. We imagine that passing into eternity will be like falling asleep, moving into some hazy, disconnected reality with smoky vision, unclear apparitions all around us, no, my friend, slipping into eternity, passing from this world to the next, is not like falling asleep. It's more like waking up. And the split second that was this life relative to eternity, this moment, this vapor, will be some distant memory as we become aware of the even more vivid reality surrounding us in eternity. It's a place of consciousness. You are aware. It's a place of torment and anguish. It's a place of sight. You will see. You will sense. You will hear. You will touch. That's what the scripture describes. Sadly, it's a place of memory. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime, People dwelling in this constant state of agony 
will remember every single time they rejected the gospel message. They'll look back with torment on the days that they received the call to respond to the gospel and repent of their sins. And they'll be filled with regret as they remember every altar call they ignored. Every time a sermon was preached, that they brushed it off. Every time a family member or loved one warned them, please avoid this place, they'll remember it and be filled with regret. It is a place of permanence. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one from there can cross over to here. My friend, once you've passed into eternity, your fate is sealed. It's done. And the scripture tells us that we're not promised tomorrow. Life is but a vapor. You don't know when you will pass into eternity. Life, my friend, is a thin, fragile glass upon which we walk. And with every step that we take, we compromise it. For every moment that we exist, we're stepping closer to the moment that we step into that place, wherever we are going. Every year, you pass the date of your death. And you don't even know it. Our bodies are temporary. Now, the body was created wonderfully, but relative to other things, it's quite fragile. Once it's broken beyond a certain point, the soul disconnects. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 say this. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God. And on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. It's a place of judgment. The consequence for every sin meets the wrath, and the justice, and the holiness of God. And worse yet, it's a place of separation from God. Of all the things I described, the worst thing about hell is that you're separated from God. And we say things like, how could a loving God allow this? Why would a God of mercy and love and compassion be for something like this? And you've heard it said from people filled and drunk on their own pride and arrogance. They say things like, well, that just wasn't a God I wanted to serve. Isn't it amazing that when it comes to the sins of others, we demand justice. When it comes to our own, we cry out for mercy. Isn't it amazing that when we read an article of someone who committed some horrific crime, that we're quick to comment on Facebook, we're quick to comment on Instagram, we're quick to send that text saying they need to send them to the chair, Oh, I wish they allowed lethal injection in that state. Oh, they need to suffer. Oh, they should torture them, then kill them. That, my friend, is your sense of justice. Knowing that wickedness needs to be punished. What we say when we communicate things like, why would a loving God allow a place like hell? Or I can't believe he would. What we're actually saying is, I don't like that he's actually going to punish my sin. The reason, my friend, that the idea of hell is so troublesome to you, the reason that the idea of hell offends you is because you're not offended enough by the idea of sin. 
We don't realize just how wicked the things we do are compared to the holiness of God. It is foolish to reject the light and then become indignant when you find that there exists a place of only darkness. Hell is only hell because it lacks all the goodness that is and proceeds from the nature of God. Turn off the light, we say. And then in the next breath, how could God allow a place of darkness? By rejecting God, you reject goodness itself. By rejecting God, you reject love, you reject peace and joy. To push away everything that is God is to push away all that you enjoy in this life. Hell, no amount of regret can appease it. For every moment that passes, another moment is added to the extent of one's stay. Deep frustration, hopeless turmoil, and constant confusion forever possess the soul. Hope is destroyed. After all, there is no mercy beyond this point. The instant your eyes catch a glimpse, your pride and stubbornness are broken. But it's too late. The moment you sense the evil, you desire the opportunity to repent. But God is not mocked. The reality is confirmed. Everything you knew in your heart to be true is now visibly apparent. You escape the thought on earth, hoping the thought would never manifest its own reality. Every moment of sinful pleasure, every comment of mockery, every laugh at God, they turn to be regrettable, sorrowful even. To know that safety was within reach is a tormenting thought. Why such foolishness? Why such carelessness? It could have all been prevented. That is a most tormenting thought. No time exists. Hell is the constant state of highest anguish. It is darkness that will never again see light. Pain that will never know comfort. And loneliness that will never again find companionship. It is the justice of God. Can you grasp the vastness of the universe? That's temporary. Hell is a universe void of all things good. Pride is the door to hell, and stubbornness is the step that takes you through. What sort of pride would walk into hellfire? What pleasure is worth the soul? Mock, laugh, scoff, doubt, and push it from your mind. It remains a reality. Only fools go to hell when salvation is so near. Frustration that causes physical tension. Fear that causes your heart to race. Anger that brings depression and pain that causes you to cry out. These are the reactions of a hellish existence. They are the eternal marks of a tormented, rejected soul. That's what I wrote when I woke up from that dream. It just flowed. If you saw someone on the train tracks playing around, I don't know why they're playing on the tracks, don't ask me. Would you not cry out if you saw a train coming? Get off the tracks. Move out of the way, it's coming. My friend, I don't speak of these things because I love the idea that someone will be tormented. I speak of these things because I love you. Now, Jesus did say also, he goes to prepare a place for us. Once you realize that hell is not just something to be avoided, but that it was something we all deserved. It makes you wonder about God's goodness and grace. <laughs> so much preaching today on how God needs me, and I'm 
I'm, I'm this and God needed me for that. And God did not need you. God does not need you. Where the cross speaks about my value and worth. No, it speaks about God's mercy. Because he could have very easily just begun again. And Jesus said, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Think about the fact that the Father God looked down and knowing his standard of justice, who he is, he is just. He says within himself, I can't let it happen. How, 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 how can we satisfy? Because God is holy and his justice must be satisfied. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, the good news of the gospel is that there's a cure for the sickness that is sin. All have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. Every single one of us deserves that punishment. All of us. Every single one of us deserve to be judged in that way. But God in his mercy and his compassion, God in his grace and his love, because he is good, because he is loving, because he is merciful, he decided to do something that he did not have to do. He came to earth as a man, died and suffered upon a cross, taking your place, your punishment, your shame. And that great exchange is this, that if you give him your temporary life, he'll give you his eternal one. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.